caught up her neck. I didn't say strangled her neck. Page 235, he set me free. Let's turn over there. The old, no, that's 305, sorry. The old, yeah, the old gospel ship. The old, the old, the old. We don't know either. We just know that we know it, and we're just going to full send it. So we should write it out, but I want to figure it out. Let's go down a couple, make sure. Let's try that key. We're not sure what key we do this in, but if we have to stop, we'll stop. That's what we ought to call it. I don't know what. I don't know what. Let me find.
find the page here. <laughs> Can I see something? Hold on. I'll... Three forty six. Three forty six. I know it was forty six. Three forty six. I thought it was two sixty. the Lord. I'm glad my name's written there. And you know the greatest part about my name being written there? No one can take it out. <laughs> can't be erased. The devil can't take it. Man can't take it. And I'm thankful that my name was written there 28 years ago. That's right, brother. Amen. The question is, is your name written there? Praise the Lord. All you know that. I don't know that. I can... Just go by what you tell me, but just because you tell me that's there doesn't mean it's there. You have to take that up with the Lord. And uh, listen, I settled it 28 years ago. Thank God. And I'm thankful that God, uh, that I settled it with him that day. 61 years, Brother Butch. Any, how many, who's been saved more? Betty, how many years have you been saved? Sixty-three, sixty-three, rich sixty-one. Thank God. Anyone been saved more than sixty-three years? My Lord, that's longer than I've been alive. Do you know what that tells me? That God's able. Amen. He can keep you. Go ahead, sissy. Bless your heart, sissy. Well, you said you were saved at ten. I'm not going to ask you how old you are. Well, I didn't ask you, but you've been saved 66 years? Praise the Lord. What's what? Listen, I'm telling that's wonderful, isn't it? Uh, I'm telling you, God's able tonight. Anybody else with a testimony? I'm going to sing a song tonight. Brother Art asked me to sing this. He's watching tonight and asked if I'd sing it. So I told him I'd do my best. So you all pray for us. <clears throat> How many of you is looking forward to going to heaven? Yeah, how in the world can you look forward to going to a place you've never been? 
I've read about it. Amen. Thank God. We've read about it. We know we don't we've never been there. I need that. If I surveyed all the good things come to me from above, I could count all the blessings from the storehouse of love. I'd simply ask for the favor of him beyond mortal end, and I'm sure that he would grant it. stroll over heaven with you some glad day where all the troubles and heartaches are vanished away then we'll enjoy the beauties where all things are new I want to stroll Places of beauty we long to see here below, but times and treasures have kept us from making plans as you know. But come the morning of the rapture, together we'll stand anew while I stroll. stroll over heaven with you some glad day where all the troubles and heartaches there vanished away when we'll enjoy the beauties where all things are new I want to stroll over heaven We renew all acquaintance with the friends we once knew. Then we'll meet all our loved ones and we'll see Jesus too. Oh, that will be a glad reunion and there will be much to view while I stroll. stroll over heaven with you some glad day where all the troubles and heartaches are vanished away and then we'll enjoy the beauties where all things are new I want to stroll
purpose your heart. Bless your heart, brother. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? <clears throat> We're going to be in 1 Peter tonight, chapter number 4, if you want to turn there. I really have uh, something on my heart. Uh, and I, I, when I stand up here, my intentions is never, ever, ever to make anybody feel bad. That's not my... I wish I could make everybody feel good. I wish I could save everybody. But I know the word of God is sharp. It's powerful. And it divides sometimes. This isn't my opinion. But it's time that God's people become God's people. What I mean by that is Christians ought to be Christians. And, and I'll explain what I'm talking about in just a little bit. We must realize where the church was at this particular time. And I remind you guys of this every Wednesday Then we get into the book of 1 Peter. The church has been scattered. They, they're, they're scattered. They, they, they have no shepherd. The world is infiltrating into the life of the church at this time. And Peter's trying to be a pastor to them and trying to encourage them, listen, you have to follow the ways of God. I understand sometimes following God is hard. But the ways of a transgressor are much harder. Did you understand what I just said? Living for God can become very challenging, but yet rewarding. But if we choose to follow the ways of man and the world, destruction is what will happen. All throughout 1 Peter, Peter is trying to encourage the church on how that they should submit. And I understand submission sometimes becomes very challenging for anybody. He tells us the wives to submit to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Christians, you su must submit yourselves to the government officials, the laws. Be uh, respectful of those laws, except if it come between you and God. If those laws that the, the government is requiring you to live by breaks the laws of God, then you have to make that decision. That's what Peter's talking about. He goes on and talks about at the end of chapter 3 how that, how that we must conduct ourselves in suffering. And let me just tell you this, if you serve Christ, you will suffer. I don't know how, but you will suffer. Because the world's ways and God's ways, listen to me, are different. They should never, ever, ever be the same. You should be able to tell if a person is serving God or if they're not by their actions. Anybody can say that they're a Christian. 85% of America says they're Christians. Well, then why is America headed to hell? Right? I'm just preaching to you the word of God here. There is a hell that's real. Amen. Just as real as heaven. And I understand everybody wants to go to heaven. But I want to remind you of something. There is judgment coming. And judgment has to begin at the house of God. Now... Before I get into this too much, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We have to remember that we're going to suffer. And because Jesus Christ died in the flesh, we have to do something. In chapter 4, the beginning part of this chapter, Peter teaches us that we have to arm ourselves. We talked about it the past few weeks. How do you arm yourself? Well, you put on the full armor of God. Listen, if we didn't have a battle on our hands, why would Paul write that we must put on the full armor of God? Why would he tell us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places? Why would, why would he tell us that? Because it's true. Every morning that you get up from bed, you're in a battle. There is a battle for your soul. A decision that you have to make every day of your life. Are you going to continue on serving God or are you going to give in to the world and the enemy? 
And can I tell you what your flesh wants to do? Give in to the enemy. Fulfill the lust of your flesh. That's the battle that we face every day. I've come too far to turn back. I know what lies ahead. How do you know, preacher? You've never seen heaven. You admitted it. I've read the back of the book. And can I tell you this? Just a little gift from heaven tonight. You're either going to take all of this or none of this. You can't divide it. <laughs> right? God's word is true. It's forever settled in heaven. It will not change. Man can change it, divide it, try to interpret it different ways. But can I tell you, friend, the word of God will stand when the world is on fire. Amen. So he starts out in chapter 4 how that we must arm ourselves. How that we should not be and live uh, and be the person that we used to be. Right? In verses 1 and 2, he talked about how that we would suffer uh, as Christ. We would su he suffered for us as a Christian. He suffered for you and me. And if God suffered for me, guess what? We're going to have to arm ourselves. In verse number 2, he talks about how that we should not no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh or the lusts of men, but to do the will of God. Right. Is doing the will of God sometimes very difficult and challenging? Sure it is. Sure it is. Because it's the battle that we face. Verse 3. We got through one verse last week. You want to know why? Because now Peter is trying to tell the church how that they must live. And in verse 3 he says, for the time past. In other words, Peter is saying, this is the person you used to be. For the, past, for the time past of our life, many suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we, when we walked, in other words, when we used to walk in what? Lasciviousness. Let, let's just quickly go over those words. This is what we used to be, what, what, we, what man used to do before coming to Christ. He used to be filled with or showing sexual desire. That's what lasciviousness means. Then he goes on to say lusts. Lust. Hey, every man is tempted. James chapter, doesn't it what the book of James teaches us? Every man is tempted when what? When we are drawn away and enticed by our own lusts, our own desires. It's carnal, fleshly, pleasure or desire. That's what lust means. And then he goes down to talk about the person we used to be. We used to drink in excess of wine. Right? What does that mean? Well, that means too much or drunkenness. That's what we used to do. Right? And I know you, we, we've got the folks that just like to just get bits and pieces of the word of God. Well, there you go, preacher. That means that we can drink. Just don't drink in excess. But the Bible teaches us that we shouldn't even look upon wine that is red you know what that means fermented in other words what he's saying is to abstain from all appearance of evil well alcohol is not evil really drink enough of it you'll find out how evil it is i've counseled a lot of people where it's destroyed their marriage now, listen, don't shoot the messenger. This is the word of God. Peter, is the church has been scattered. That's the problem with today's church. They've been scattered because no one knows what's right and what's wrong. Huh? Woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. Nobody knows what's right or wrong anymore. Is it right to drink? Is it wrong to drink? Is it right to live in a, a, a fornication or is it wrong? Well, it depends on who you ask. I told you this, don't come to me. If you have a question, you go to the Word of God. And most likely, if you come to me and ask me a question on advice of what you should or shouldn't do, you probably ought not do it. Right. Or you wouldn't come asking me. Peter, the Word of God teaches us how to live. The problem is we don't want to live the way the Bible has instructed. We want to find somebody or some version that will meet up with our lifestyle. Right? But Peter just lays it out. Lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings. That's those going out and raising a ruckus. Banquetings. That's those that entertain people, bring them into their homes to entertain them just to quote unquote social drink. Let me tell you this I don't believe in social drinking. 
I believe it's a lie straight from hell. I've never met a social drinker that has at one time in their lives drunk too much. <laughs> that may not go over too well, but that's okay. It's the truth. We're either going to be a child of God or a child of the world. Peter goes on to say abominable idolatries. That means worshiping anything other than God. Boy, you look in today's society, even in the church, we wonder what we really do idolize. If we're not careful, we could idolize the building. God doesn't live in the building. If we're not careful, we'll idolize people. You ever wondered why that Hollywood has such an impact on the world? Because that's what the world is looking to. <laughs> Let me tell you something, church. Don't look to your pastor. Look to God. Look to your pastor for advice, but make sure the advice that your pastor gives you lines up with the word of God. Because I trust... I, listen to me. When you stand before God in judgment, and you will... You will not be able to say, well, Pastor Mark told me so. That won't get it. What will become reality is not what I said, but what thus saith the word of God. Now let's go to verse 4. Maybe tonight we can get through more than one verse. So now, we ended last week with a question on, I asked you if you really wanted to know what was in your heart. Remember that question? I said, you really want to know what is on your heart or in your heart? Here's the answer. It's what you think about all the time. What comes to your mind? What stays in your mind? What do you wake up with? What do you go to bed with? What makes you motivated? Is it God? Is it sex? Is it your job? Only you know that answer. But here in, in verse number 4 of chapter 4, notice, let's read verses 4, 5, and 6. In verse 4, Peter says this, wherein, well, let me, let me back up and read verse 3 and tie it in with 4, 5, and 6. In verse 3, Peter says, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it's strange. In other words, the world, the world, those that's not saved, think it's strange that ye run not with them to the same. Excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give an account of him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Let me stop there. Now, as I said earlier, tonight I'm going to hit hard on what is expected biblically from a Christian. Peter tells us in verse 3 what we used to be. What we used to do, lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries. But notice in verse 4, he says, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to do the same. In other words, what Peter is saying here, the world, if you're living the life that God wants you to live, the world will look at you and they will question and wonder who in the world you are. You'll be different. Amen. You'll understand what I'm telling you tonight. Listen to me. This is what people of the world think of Christians. If they're living for God. They will look at them differently and see that there's something different about them. They think that it's strange or odd that you don't do the same things as them. So here's the question. Those watching by internet or you here tonight, are you doing and participating in the things that you used to participate and do? That's the question. Because if you are, the world doesn't see a change in you. Oh, I know you can get all spiritual and say, well, the world doesn't know my heart. You're exactly right, but God does. And the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. 
Behold, all things are become. Well, preacher, you done said that we sometimes it's a battle of the flesh. Absolutely. And we all make mistakes. Would you all agree with me tonight? Amen. We all sin. We come short. The Bible says there's none good. No, not one. Right? But that doesn't mean when I don't do good that I continue to do not good. It doesn't excuse it. Yes, you're weak. Yes, you allow the enemy to come. And yes, you think thoughts you shouldn't. And yes, you do things that you shouldn't do. But at that particular point, the Spirit of God will convict your heart. Amen. That's what conviction is. Right. right? And then you'll have a decision to make. Are you sorry for what you've done? Because God has revealed to you that it's wrong. And you do something about it. You repent. I think the church has lost the word repent. But Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When I got saved, I repented. But let me tell you something. I've repented more since I've come to know Christ than before. Because I'm not good. I'm not perfect. I sin. I need God's forgiveness. And the Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Now, let me tell you, this does not excuse us. We should not use repentance as an excuse to sin. Amen? Well, God understands, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and do this. I'm going to go ahead and commit adultery, and I'll ask the Lord to forgive me. Well, let me tell you something. You're playing with fire. <laughs> what if something happens in the midst of your adultery? <laughs> huh? What if that you... Uh, uh, got in that moment and you didn't repent and you th that that joy that 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 pleasure let me say pleasure that's what it is there's pleasure in sin but it's only for a season what if that pleasure felt so good to your flesh that you actually forgot about god or you justified your sin see that's what most people's doing we're justifying my sin it's okay to do this, or it's not okay to do this. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you, not my opinion, I'm going to tell you what thus saith the word of God. Sin is still sin today. Amen. God has not changed. Sin has not changed. And more, let me just tell you this, more prevalent today than ever, sin is running rampant. Amen. And it's being justified and accepted in all cultures and most churches. And I refuse to stand behind the pulpit of God's most sacred place and tell you that it's okay for you to do things. Because, see, I don't want to stand before God and say, why did you teach them that? Thank God I'm not your judge, and thank God you're not my judge. <laughs> you ought to be thanking God that he's fair and he's just. Because if it had been up to me, I'd have been kicked out a long time ago. Where's my hanky? Amen. I'm thankful that God's mercies are new every day. In verse 4, he says, Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. They speak evil of you. Why? Because they see a change. They see that you're different. And listen to me. If you're truly serving God, the world will look at you and say, There is just something strange about you. There is something different about you. You want to know what should be strange and different? You shouldn't participate and do the things that you used to do prior to being saved. You say, out your amen. It's Listen, there's a lot of things I don't do that I used to do. And I didn't have to go to the preacher to ask him what was right and what was wrong. The Holy Spirit's a lot bigger than the preacher. The problem is we don't want the Holy Spirit near us. Only when we want to feel good. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit doesn't always feel good. Matter of fact, the Bible says he that is without chastisement. Conviction is a bastard and not a son. So listen, if God steps on your toes, not the preacher. If God gets on your toes, kicks your sin and breaks your heart, you ought to thank him for that. That's conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what Peter is trying to get across to the church. Serving God sometimes requires us to separate ourselves from the things of the world. And if we have a desire to be and act like the world, then our problems are much greater than that. It's a spiritual problem. It's not a mind thing either. It is a heart thing. I am preaching tonight, by the way. 
The Bible teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, Wherefore, come out from among them, Paul said. Come out from among them, the world, the way you used to be, right? And be ye separate. Paul didn't say this. Paul said, saith the Lord. Amen. When people see you, when they hear you, when they look to you, what do they see? What do they hear? What are they looking at? Are they looking and hearing an example of a godly individual or a person that is still talking and acting and living like the world? In verse 18 of chapter 6, 2 Corinthians, he says, And I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Let me, let me just say this. If you are a friend of the world, not to the world, but of the world. Did you get that? James chapter 4, verse 4, talks about being a friend of the world. What is being a friend of the world any different than being a friend to the world? Here's the difference. We should all be a friend to the world. We should preach love. We should preach Jesus, crucified, risen, coming again, right? That's love. Telling them that Jesus loves them. Telling them that they need to be saved. Telling them this, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. That's love. That's not hate. That's the truth, right? Well, what does it mean being a friend of the world? A friend of the world is this, participating in what the world participates in. Now, let me just tell you in, in James chapter 4, verse 4, it says, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy with God. You can't be both. Why did Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation said, I would that you'd be cold or hot as to be lukewarm? For if you're lukewarm, he would, you know what that means, spew? That means vomit you. It makes him sick. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. God has saved you. He's changed your heart, but it's up to you to change your mind. And remember this, the devil can't get to your heart, so what's he going to do? He's going to go for your mind. And when he gets to your mind, you start questioning the things of God, and then before you know it, you change your heart. And you return just like the dog returns to its vomit. You desire to go back and do the things you used to do. And listen, you begin to justify him. There's a reason why I, as a pastor, don't drink. Number one, I'm convicted of it. Number two, I, knew what it, I know what it does. That's my conviction. I know the families that it destroys. I know the lives that it has taken. When God took it away from me, he took it away. Now, you and I may not agree the same. That's okay. But I would ask you this question. If you decide to drink, does it honor and please God? Only you can answer that. For me, it wouldn't. It convicts me because I see what it does and what it leads to. No social drinker ever steps out to be an alcoholic. Tell that to the family sitting in the front row that lost their son because of drunkenness. It never leads anywhere good. There is pleasure in sin. You may not like this here tonight at this church, but that's okay. You can just say, Pastor, you're no longer welcome here. I'll take my suitcase and go. God will have me somewhere else, I promise you. Because as God is my witness, and as long as I am doing what God wants me to do, I'll preach against the sin. It's wrong. Not only is it wrong for me, but what does it do to my testimony? What does it do for my witness? Right? Does it, does it take me bellying up with you at a bar to, to, to convince you that you need to come to Christ? What kind of a testimony is that? If you see, if somebody else sees me going into a bar to have fellowship with somebody else in the bar, what's the change in the church and the world? Be a separate people. 
Someone told me one time, well, the Bible really doesn't say much about drinking. Well, you don't know much about the Bible, do you? The first time it was mentioned in the, the Word of God, it was with Noah. Fermented. He got drunk. And he was a preacher of righteousness. You want to know how devastating drinking is? Lot got so drunk that twice he slept with his own daughters and got impregnated. So you mean to tell me that's good? <laughs> Now, I can go on and on and on about what it does, and I know I'm just picking on that, but it seems to be a big issue in today's society. Abstain from all appearance of evil. I, I, I better move on. I, I don't, trust me, I don't mean to offend anybody, but if the Word of God touches your heart, then you'll have to take that up with Him. I don't want to stand before God and tell you that it's okay. In verse... Number four, he talks about how that we should not run with them and do the same in excessive riot or do the extremes because they'll speak evil of you. But notice in verse five, this is why that I believe for me that it's wrong. Look at verse number five. Why do we preach separation? Why do we preach not living like we used to? Well, look at verse number five. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead you know what peter's saying there that you will give an account to him god that is ready to judge the quick and the dead the alive and the dead the saved and the lost judgment cannot be escaped matter of fact in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 the Bible teaches us and as it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment let me ask you something why do we want to try to justify our lifestyle if God says it's wrong why because it makes us feel better well I would be concerned with with that if God convicts you of something, listen, I'm not asking you to believe how I believe. Hey, smoking may be okay for you, but it's not for me. I was convicted by it. Chewing snuff, I love to chew snuff. I chewed snuff after I got saved, clear up to the time God called me to preach. And then one night I was sitting there and I was spitting in this cup, studying the Word of God, getting ready to preach the Word of God. I'm not, listen, I'm not telling you it's sin. That's not what I'm, but to me it is. And he that knoweth to do good and do it not to him, it is sin. God convicted my heart and he said, how in the world can you preach my word with something in your lip? And I know that we shouldn't look to people and look at their lives and say, well, uh, you, know, you know, the Bible says judge not unless you be judged and all that good stuff. And people like to take that, that, that scripture out of character and, and, and what it really means. But if it convicts me, listen, sometimes overeating convicts me. Someone help me right listen we're just mentioning a few things you know I, I know going into restaurants when there's ruckusing and maybe serving alcohol can be convicting to some and you must live your life you're going to give your account of your life whether it be good or bad i'm just trying to help you make sure that if god convicts you of something that you go by your convictions and not because somebody else tells you you don't have to explain it to me. You'll have to look before to, to God, right? But in verse number five, he said, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Peter reminds us that they too will stand before God and give an account of their lives. If we live like we used to and there's no change, notice this, we bring confusion to the world. If I'm still doing the same things I used to do before I was saved, it brings confusion to the world. There's no change. Cal Ray said, no change, no Jesus. I, I believe it. No change, no Jesus. I believe that's scriptural. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I've said it before. Where does judgment start? The house of God, the Bible teaches us in the book of 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to get into this in just 
uh, a few more verses. If you'll look down at verse number 17 of chapter 4, he says this, For the time is come. Notice that, not was come or will come. He says, for the time is come. That means right now. That judgment must begin at the house of God. The house of God. I don't know your heart, but God does. And tonight, God looks at your heart. And let me ask you, what does he see when he looks at it? For the judgment must come and begin at the house of God. And notice this, if it first begin at us, the Christians, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel? It's a question that Peter is asking us. Listen, if judgment begins with us, where is it going to end with those that doesn't know Christ? Notice this in verse 18. I don't know about your Bible, but this verse here is capitalized in my Bible. It says, and if the righteous, notice that next word, scarcely be saved. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Boy, I don't know about you, but that puts things into perspective, doesn't it? I wonder why Jesus said, and he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Why did Paul say to put on the whole armor of God, that, that you would be able to stand in the evil days? Why did he say that perilous times shall come? You know what perilous means? It means dangerous, evil. Every day you turn on the television, what do you hear? Someone getting shot. Evil. Evil everywhere. Now, Lotus in verse number six, and we'll come to close. First Peter chapter four, verse six. Peter says, For this cause was the gospel preached. Also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to God in the Spirit. Let me ask you something. If everybody, just because Jesus Christ come, and he came to save that which was lost, if everybody is saved and everybody is going to heaven, why do we come to church? Why does the preacher, why was the message that Jesus Christ and, and John preached repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? If he died on the cross and all of our sins have been forgiven, we have nothing to worry about, right? Why are we here? Why do we preach? Would there be a need for a preacher? Would be no need. Why is it when someone dies that you call the preacher? Can I can't help them to get to heaven, right? Because they're all going. If that's how we believe, you want to know why? That's not how we believe. Because God has given us a way, and the way is Jesus Christ. And listen to me, we're not getting to heaven, but only through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> why would he tell Nicodemus, to repent be born again why would he tell him that if we didn't have to live for christ and repent and be born again for this cause was the gospel preached we preach the gospel tonight to give an opportunity for those that's lost to be saved and for those that's saved to encourage them to fight the good fight of faith and listen if we're all going to heaven why would we have it what's there to fight against why should we fight the good fight of faith if everyone's going to heaven? You want to know why? Because not everyone is going to heaven. Many are called, but few are chosen. I understand that's not popular. I understand that's not what people want to hear. And I understand people won't come to this church where we preach that you need to be saved because they leave here feeling bad. If you get saved, you can leave feeling good. 
And it's not that we hate, but we love because we love you so much, we want to see your life changed. Because when your life is changed, listen, as Peter said, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. You see, that's why we preach what we preach. We love you. We want to see you saved. We want to see you live for Christ. Listen, I like what Brother Bobby said last Sunday. Don't leave this life leaving no testimony. Don't leave this life not having a testimony to leave for your family. Don't do it to yourself. Because there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain, whether you want to believe it or not. And the only way to heaven is through Christ. And that's why we preach the gospel. That is the gospel. Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, risen. And I like this best part. He's coming again. And he's coming for a church that's washed white with the precious blood of Christ. As we stand tonight. Paul says this. Romans chapter 1 verse 14 and